Welcome to another edition of Toka Backstage. This is Christian Wolf, the Executive Director of the Torrance Cultural Arts Foundation. It is my extreme honor to have uh, Mr. George Tovar and Jonathan Levitt from, uh, who will be performing in Magic Up Close at the Nakano Theater on uh, April 17th and 18th, which is a Friday and Saturday. So time is eight o'clock. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time. I certainly do appreciate it. Pleasure to be here. Um, so the thing about Magic Up Close was uh, we've done the big stage shows with the Tigers and the Lions and the Hoopla, but it always, people are always more amazed when they're like up close and, and seeing it in front of them. What, as magicians, what inspired you to do close up as opposed to getting into the big illusion arena? Let's start with you, George. Um, I actually used to do kind of stage magic. Uh, I used to do like work with doves and things like that and, and big tricks. And then I met a gentleman by the name of Earl Nelson and uh, he just changed my world. I decided I wanted to go into that direction. Uh, I was seeing things up close that he was doing and uh, I said, that's what I want to dedicate my life to. Also, I'm also an actor. So uh, the idea of, you know, renting space to rehearse, assistance, all that thing, studios to work in, it was just more conducive to what I want to do in my career, which is like, I can walk around, I have a pack of cards, coins, whatever, and I can, you know, work on my, my craft at all times rather than doing stage stuff takes a lot more uh, space, effort, time, that sort of thing. Cool. How about you, Jonathan? I actually, uh, I, oh, there we are. I started uh, performing when I was 12 as a street performer. And so I was actually doing, parlor style magic but also growing up always doing close-up magic and also put my feet in and did some uh some stage work some illusion work which uh figured out probably wasn't for me at the time it's too <laughs> short actually too short i couldn't reach the top uh the top uh, blade but uh, uh <laughs> i eventually came back to a little bit of it later in life but but uh, so i kind of dabble in all of the the areas but close-up really is my I think my, my favorite, and it goes to a little bit of what uh, George is saying there too. It's you, you can have something on you at all times or have nothing on you and still pick up something around you and do something. Uh, it's it's uh, the most accessible, uh, I think, and, and to be able to do, to do some magic and form, form it right away. And so I, I've always dabbled in it, and, and, or I've always been committed to all, all forms of the, uh, of the art, but close up has always been just has always taken me. And, and I, ever since I was a kid, I was doing card tricks, you know. And, and, reading, and reading and reading. do you guys remember the first uh, card trick you learned? I do. Uh, it was one of those uh, TV ad, TV magic card things. It was the, you know, they're selling them in thrifty stores that don't even exist anymore. But uh, the TV magic deck of cards, I bought it and it's, I came later to know, I learned on later that it was, it's really an old thing called the Sengali deck, but this guy who marketed it called it TV Magic Cards, and uh, it was, it was the first trick I ever did. It was great. Uh, you know, I don't remember the first tr card trick I ever learned, but I remember the first card trick I ever performed in front of a group. My father was a magician, and uh, he taught me this trick that involved four piles of four, and some, some uh, equivocate to kind of get down to one card and it was the selected card, which ultimately, now that I think about the plot, is basically the same plot of every card trick we've ever done anyway, so. <laughs> Aren't they all? <laughs> all the same. Pick a card, find it. Okay, then it's all dressing after that, isn't it, Jonathan? Exactly, 100%. <laughs> um, um, one of the things I find interesting is um, when I, like, I was, when I was growing up and I was a young magician, I had a magic shop that I would like spend every waking moment in with the guy who would like show me new things. And there was, there, that was sort of the, where the community started. Nowadays, it seems like everything is online is, and it, it, there's that, that connection that's kind of missed, I think. Do you guys find that to be ca the case? And if so, is there a way to sort of that you recommend kids learn and get connected to the community? 
Yeah, unfortunately, the, the brick and mortar shops are less, um, uh, they're less, they're, they're, there is less of them than there used to be. And, and they're so important. You know, we have one shop here in, in Los Angeles, the Magic Apple, and it's, it's a vital place. And, and we can't, we, we, you know, we had Hollywood Magic, right? George, you worked at yeah, Hollywood I, Magic. I worked there for many years. That's where I met the gentleman I talked about, Earl Nelson. But even when I was a kid, I would go there. Uh, when I was 12 years old, my parents would take me there. It's a long drive for me back then as a kid coming from Culver City to Hollywood. But they would take me once a month. And there was this old guy who was doing the tricks at the counter. And, you know, they taught you the tricks. And but I thought he was the owner, but he was. He was just a salesman who's just been there a long time. But and it was, a, a, like you said, a community, and it really kind of helped garner that thing. And then as I became a worker there, I started working there, you know, magicians from all over the country would stop there before working in the Magic Castle. And it was a great kind of a community thing. And that is gone now. That It seems like today's thing, it's all learning it through YouTube and things like that. And they really miss kind of that mentoring thing. Because magic is not just the trick and the secret. It's really more about uh, style and how you perform it and interacting with people that's really a major part of magic and and, and on, online you don't get that it's just trick secret oh that's how it's done yeah that's my I, w I would say uh also the the magic uh organizations the international brotherhood magician primarily if you're young uh but also the society of american G magicians which has the society of young magicians so these organizations are are also vital. So if we can't take advantage of the magic shops, uh, I would suggest that people reach out to those communities, you know, to those groups. And even here in Los Angeles, we have the Magic Castle. We think, well, that's it, but it's not it. We have IBM and SAM and SYM uh, uh, chapters and, and rings. Uh, and they meet like once a month, right, Jonathan? Yeah, they yeah, do. And, and it, it, I, I wouldn't, I would not be anywhere today without the. Uh, uh, International Brotherhood of Magicians Ring One in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I wouldn't be anywhere without it. You know, the people that I was in there with and uh, surrounded by, and the, the mentors that I had out of that are, were invaluable. So, uh, the, if the, if you can't find a magic shop, which you should, you should also find uh, one of these organizations. And I remember, you know, I have a story. I I uh, went home from college after freshman year, and uh, during the summer, I went to one of the IBM meetings, International Brotherhood of Magicians, and in St. Louis. And there was a a mother and a child, her child there. And I met them, and and he was very introverted and very shy. And, and she said to me, "Well, you know, he wanted to come here. I, I, I didn't want to bring him. You know, she was not supportive." <laughs> and so that summer, I worked with him, and he took part in the IBM ring meetings and, uh, and I worked with them a little bit on the outside. I came back a year later and she came up to me and thanked me and said, this is, this has changed his life. It's the best thing that could have happened to him. And he was, you know, more uh, extroverted and open and, and it was life changing. And uh, I thought, well, I'm done. That's all, that's all I, you know, what else do I need, you know, we need to do. So those, those, those are the great moments. And those, so those organizations are invaluable. And uh, but don't you also think though, that that's kind of what magic, does? I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but speaking for myself, when I was 12, 13, I was like super introverted. And it wasn't until I learned how to drop a, put a coin under a handkerchief, drop it in a glass of water and pull it out. And it was gone. That it was like, my life changed. And it was like, wow, this is, I, I have the power to entertain people. That's pretty cool. Um, do, do you think that ha that's part of the magic of magic for people who get into it? I totally agree. I mean, working in the magic shop, I would see these young kids and coming in and they were kind of awkward and, and you know, just not very self-confident. And the fact of doing a, a magic trick for somebody really just opened them up. And, and a lot of them, you know, not most of them become professional magicians, but it didn't matter. It, it changed their life in that direction that they could be. It was a way to start interacting with people that you didn't know, or even if you did know, if you weren't funny or you weren't the jock or whatever, it, it gave you that kind of um, uh, comfortableness with them. They, hey, I can do something and you don't know how it's done. And it's, and, it, and, it, and they wanted to talk to you. You were fascinating now. And it, it's a really a great thing. I mean, so many people, and they went on in life doing other things, but it was a start, like you said. I, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, so when you guys perform uh, close-up, 
do you find do you ever get like concerned about some of the people that you're performing for if you're sitting at a table i always have this envisionment of like somebody getting a little too handsy with the cards or the props <laughs> does that ha ever happen to you guys wow <laughs> go ahead jonathan <laughs> yeah it's happened uh but you know we we control <laughs> We control the situation, right? Uh, somebody just asked me that the other day, actually. Yeah. Uh, they we control the situation. I don't put myself usually in a position where I'm going to allow anything to happen that isn't acceptable. Uh, or if something does go south or go in a direction I wasn't planning for, then I wouldn't be ready for it. I just don't put myself in that situation, right? So we have to control, we, have, we know when things can be touched, when they can't be touched. You know, when we say, go ahead and shuffle the cards, and they do, and we react in a way that they've destroyed everything, well, they haven't destroyed everything, and it's okay, and, uh, and we wouldn't have allowed you to shuffle the cards if you couldn't shuffle the cards. So when we say, when a magician says, go ahead and shuffle the cards, you don't have to shuffle the cards. <laughs> <laughs> You're ruining one of the biggest secrets of magic because people. I see people going, "Oh, I'm going to get them now. I'm going to get them now." <laughs> hey, Jonathan, thanks. That goes half my act now. Okay? <laughs> no, uh, actually, it's really the key to that. That whole um, we call them hecklers or, or, or over aggressive uh, spectators is um, experience. And there's, when I teach, I've taught students in the past. I go, "Look, there's nothing you can do. I can't teach you how to do that. It's experience." And, and I remember, I mean, my, my Johnson did street magic, but I worked, used to work in restaurants uh, when I was starting out. I, I worked in a magic shop. I learned my craft there and this mentor. And then I went out to start working restaurants. And that's like, you know, people drinking and it's late night and, you know, they're aggressive. It's a bar. But you just, nothing beats experience of doing it over and over. I would do, you know, 15 performances a night, five nights a week. And after that, you just learn how to, Control, like John said, control situations. And so uh, you can't do anything about that until you just do the show, just do the work in the trenches and then you get it. And so now, yeah, I still get hecklers, but uh, from experience, I've just learned how to control them either by my voice, my attitude, by never letting a situation, uh, letting myself, like Johnson said, be in a situation where they can ruin something. And you only get that from doing it thousands and thousands of times. There's just really no other way around it. Yeah, I, I, sometimes I've noticed too that when when things go a bit as, awry, like I have a um, last year we did uh, Steve Valentine's show. Oh, great, um, great show! And there was a person that got up and they started going off of, on a tangent, and his reaction to that was pure brilliance, and it was like it actually made the show a little more fun because it he got to riff a little bit. Yeah. Um, so when people come, here, here's a question. When, when people come see a magic show as a performer, what is your, what is it you, besides fooling them, what is your, what is it you want to give to them or what do you want them to walk away with? Jonathan? <laughs> uh -huh. What do we want them to walk away with? Yeah. I mean, it sounds pretty cliche uh, to say a sense of awe and wonder and joy. Um, but I would say a sense of wonder, awe, and joy. Uh, you know, I, I used to, you know, that, that's changed for me over the years. I, I used to believe I wanted them just to leave smiling, laughing, having a great time, and then on the drive home, reflecting and thinking, what the, what just happened? Uh, you know, and, and have them think about it later on. Uh, that's changed for me a, a bit now. And uh, I still, I want them to be laughing. For me, if I if I know that they're laughing and engaged and they're pulled in and they feel like a, a kid again, uh, then I'm really happy. But also, I want them to have those moments of surprise and absolute astonishment during the show, right? I want those those hits where they just say, "I have no idea what just happened." So I want you know, it's a combination of those two things. But but helping people feel like a kid again is is kind of what it's all about. And I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, that's exactly what it, I mean. I've said this since I was younger. Uh, as we get adults, you know, we lose uh, all these things that as a kid, there's wonder, uh, the holiday, you know, uh, and all these things that we believe in that's magical and 
fairy tales and all that stuff. But as an adult, you, you grow up and you go, hey, you know, that's all kind of a thing. And magic, and I don't care how they react, they go, oh, yeah, it's just a trick. That one moment when they don't know what's happened, that one moment, just before the mask comes back on their face, they just go, I have no idea what just happened, how that's possible. You're bringing them back to that sense of wonder as a kid. And I've always felt that, um, that we're bringing, giving them, that's why magic I think is so valuable, is that for just a moment, and they'll, some people will never admit it. They go, nah, it's just a trick. Didn't matter. For the moment they don't know what's happened, they kind of went, I have no idea. It's a sensible. And I, I don't get to have that that often anymore because I've been in the business for a long time. But when it happens to me, once in a while, a magician will come along and I go, I have no idea. It brings me back to what got me in the magic. I just go, wow, I don't know what he did. And that's great. It's rare, but it happens. And it's a wonderful feeling. And I love it. George, I was going to say the same thing. When we, when we, uh, they say their biggest thrill as a magician is to be fooled. Right? Because we never get to do that. And right? it's harder now. That yeah. mo those moments, I mean, I, I, you know, you love it. You go, I, I love it. You know, you have no idea. Last night, I, we saw uh, Bob Gebert in the, uh, the parlor at the Magic oh, Castle. Oh, great, Bob, yeah. And uh, I don't know. I must have looked away at the wrong moment. <laughs> but but that la his last effect, I'm, I have no idea what he did. Right. I have no right. idea. And, and I'm trying to backtrack. And, and uh, it's awesome. Just awesome. It's a great feeling. Yeah. It doesn't happen often. No. Well, it's funny because it, it, the, the way you're describing that performance last night, I took a friend of mine to the castle. We sat in the close-up room and he was one of the people called up to, to help. And this was probably like a year and a half ago. And to this day, when we're with a group of people, he's like, and that time at the castle where the guy had the, had me take the cards and, and he go, it, he, he like lights up talking about this effect. And of course it, it gets a little more grandiose every time he yes. tells it, you know, start off with a coin. Now it's like three coins. And, um, but it's, it's, it's too bad that the magician who did that couldn't see this guy to this day talking about that effect. Right. It's, yeah. it's one of the joys that we have, right. Is to hear, what the retelling of a trick it's amazing yeah. Yeah. right it's amazing and you know our job is our job is to create a false reality for our audience for our audience right to 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 give them an impression of what happened that isn't necessarily what happened it's part of our job and and it's always fun to hear the playback and you know it, it sort of that's also educational for us we get to hear did we do it right did we make them believe what we wanted them to believe, right? Because it's yeah. not always, sometimes it's exact one-to-one, -one, but it's not always one-to-one, -one, right? Yeah. But that's, I think that's gonna be the beauty of this show is that it's, it's in such an intimate space. It's almost like, for those who, who've never been, it's like going to the castle close-up room because you have you know, a small group of people and just one guy in a, in a deck of cards or coins or whatever, blowing your mind it's it's like just so i'm urging people get your tickets now before they're all gone because we can't add seats well chris i was going to mention that really just really quickly that what you just said is that i'm a big believer in because magic is so popular now on tv with penn and teller and all the shows and things like that but i truly felt and i always have that magic to be experienced like what you're talking about has to be seen live because i don't care how many disclaimers they say that there's no trick things that enters the mind. There's also the feeling of like, I'm watching what the camera is watching rather than I can look anywhere I want. And to me, that's why I love, especially close-up magic, because even on the stage, I may go, hey, it's a trap door, it's a mirror, it's something, I don't know what. But when it's close up, you're right there. You're experiencing this thing and there are no other filters. There's nothing there that can, uh, and that's why I think what you're doing, this show is great. I do a lot of close-up shows all over. For people to experience, I think it's one of the greatest things in the sense that they get to watch it right there and there's no other filters and they know it's not anything trick but just the magician and what he's using in his show. And I, I really truly believe that, that I don't care how well they shoot on TV, it's not the same experiences as seeing close-up magic live. I really believe that. Uh, and, and going to that point, it's like when there's a, a, a stage performance and they bring out a small close-up thing and there's like a video camera up above, it's like it still, it still loses it because yep. you're not, it's not like right there. 
exactly. I'm not a big fan of that. I know a lot of guys do that, but I'm not a big fan of it. Me, magic, uh, and the, the thing about magic close up though is it's gotta be an intimate small group. You, you can't do it for, yeah. like you said, without a camera for 100, 200 people. It's, it's gotta be a small group right there who can see the tabletop or whatever, and you've got a great show. I, I, that's always been my belief, and, I've, and I love close up magic for that aspect. We have a venue here in Encino, California called Magic Bar, right? And we put 16 people in that room. That's it. Best. The best. It's, yeah. the, it's awesome. Oh, wow. It is awesome. It's such an intimate, I mean, we're right there, you know, and we're not, it, it, it's one of the most fun places for me to perform. Uh, and, you know, and, and I've even done the close, you know, George, I mean, I, we've done the close up room, right? We put 22 at the Magic Castle. 22, 24 people in that room. And I've done some of the best shows of my life in that room where I come away going, that was incredible. Wow, that was one for the history books. That was amazing. And 24 people saw it. That's, that's, that's the one thing about our lives yeah. as close to magicians. Like, you know, Copperfield does a show and it's a thousand people and whatever. And us, you know, I can work the whole week at the castle. I've maybe entertained. 150 people. <laughs> so we got to do a lot of shows right. to get that impact. But those 20 people Feels are great. Mm -hmm. bring something really that you can't see anywhere else. Yeah, it's very special. Awesome. Well, I, I think that's a great place to wrap this up. So don't forget, it's Magic Up Close, April 17th and 18th at the Nakano Theater, uh, starring George Tovar and Jonathan Levitt. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for taking the time. I certainly do appreciate it. Um, right. And we look forward to seeing you then. Can't wait. Look forward to it. Great talking to you. Take it Thanks. easy, Jonathan. See you, George. See you, Christian. <laughs>